Hi there and welcome. Uh, my name is Nikki O'Neill and I am here at the studio of the Corning Museum of Glass with my students and my TA, Becky Snyder. And we are here for a week conducting numerous projects using window glass and tempered glass, which is the same as window glass, but I'll get into that, and bottle glass and recycled glass. And I'm so excited about this class. We are making so many things and it's so enjoyable to be able to use and reuse material that's just often just discarded and it's also often free. So let me give you a real short intro and then we'll get started on a couple projects um, that we're gonna be doing tomorrow in this class. Uh, I'm a biologist, mycologist, uh, did that for Oh gee, 35 years, and I'm interested in the small creatures and nature. Those little uh, pizza fungi are only a quarter inch, quarter inch tall. Um, as a biologist, I really enjoy looking through the microscope, and I spent many years doing that. This is a desmid. It's like a diatom, beautiful structure, and they are silicates, which means they are boxes uh, with an external shell of glass. So. Um, my interest is in exploring glass in its many forms, and I found that I can express my internal voice through glass. Okay, one thing I was saying that glass is almost free. This is a dumpster near uh, where I live. There are a lot of glass pr producing companies that make doors and they make windows. And make... Anyway, if you go dumpster diving, you can get a lot of this for free. So I started doing that, and then the company got really nervous uh, with me out there with my gloves. So I made friends with a guy named Todd, who's a glass cutter. He said, well, the dumpster comes every Thursday, so if you come Wednesday, you can have some glass. So here he is with some sheets. We dropped them. This is tempered glass, you can see. I collected them all and brought them home. So today what I'm going to do is use a window glass, tempered gla non-tempered glass, and we're going to make a reverse relief sculpture. Uh, this is a sycamore leaf, and I'll show you how to cut that out. This is a Samara, which is maple seeds in, in, a, um, in a whorl of three. These are aspen leaves, and this is the actual model I think I used for that. These are just paper. Okay, so I'm going to um, go back to that, and we'll, we'll stop with the slides, and I want to get on with our de demo. So if you'd like to make, in a single firing, uh, a, little, a piece of a vessel that to me looks a lot like art as well, all you need is a, a disc of glass and a mold. And there are numerous molds available. I love these bullseye ball molds. I use them almost exclusively. But to get this pattern, we need a model. And I really like leaves, as you can see. So um, how do you get that impression on this piece of glass? Well, you take your model, move these, and you Reproduce it in fiber paper. This is, this is the model for the bones of a fish for a dish. There, yeah, which is kind of cool. Um, this is two ginkgo leaves. You can make something very simple by uh, cutting out these in fiber paper and then firing them underneath your glass. That's sort of a model. You can use any kind of organics to do this. And so we're gonna start with cutting out your model. So I have a, an old botany press here that uh, is still very functional. And if it's winter time, you can't find leaves, so you can uh, press them for later use. So here are some uh, different leaves, tulip poplar, oak, 
beautiful oak, maple, let's see, sycamore, and I'm going to take this tulip poplar leaf. So once you have your model, you can draw it on eighth inch fiber paper. Now this is, eighth inch is pretty stiff. It's really nice. Uh, and it's not so stiff that you can't put it at the bottom of a mold and conform to the mold. But it give, will give you about an eighth inch uh, depth relief. So, so you draw around your leaf. And of course, you can get a lot online. You don't have to use the actual material. But I really like to use the actual material because you can see clearly where the veins are. And you can um, emphasize the areas that, that you like that make it look more, more natural. OK, so then we need to, now I'm going to keep this for reference. So we need to cut this out. You can use an X-Acto knife. You can use scissors. I'm going to talk a little bit more about float glass, window glass, and uh, what properties it has that you, we need to pay attention to if we're going to fuse it, because it Window glass is not meant, not manufactured to be refused. So, or you know, after the production process. So, uh, by paying attention to a few parameters that we're going to discuss, you can melt window glass. Okay, so we have our tulip poplar. We have our model. I have a big one here. This is, uh, we have a big sycamore tree in our backyard. So this is, a, really makes a really pretty dish. So now we want to um, put this in a mold and have it stay there in the mold while we put a disc on top and let it sink into the mold. So I'm going to show you how to do that. All right, here's a, a mold. It's a little oversized for this project, but it'll work. The mold has been kiln washed, okay? So it will release the glass wherever the glass touches it. And I said what we're gonna do is place this eighth inch fiber paper in the mold, kiln wash it, we're gonna put a disc on top, and fire it. So it's a single firing, a single quarter inch disc of glass. And it fires overnight and you're done. So we need to kiln wash this so uh, the glass won't stick. And we're going to, to use shelf primer and water. Kiln wash is easy to mix up. Usually you do a ratio of about five to one. Uh, you can make it thicker for some applications or thinner if you're spray, spraying it on a, like a stainless steel mold or something that uh, you want to heat up and do over and over. So that's one part. This is five parts. And there, there are no measurements on here, so this is a very approximate. But it all works. You can always add water, if you, more water if you need to. OK, so here's our kiln wash. And I'll have a little brush. So I've drawn the veins on this. And what I plan to do after this gets kiln washed is, is put these little veins on here to give it more of a relief and make it look more natural. So for now, I'll just pour some of this on. And we want to get it on the bottom, too, so that the 
bottom of the um, fiber paper will stick to the mold. Okay. All right, so I'm going to put that in. And try to center it pretty much. And then I'm going to press it down. I'm going to, I'm going to need that because I'll have to kiln wash these. So this will be my relief casting. Sometimes you might, see it's already sticking, that's nice. Um, you might have to soak it for a while. Um, the kiln wash, I can usually get a couple firings out of this process, but if you want to make this more permanent, you can actually rigidize the eighth inch fiber paper with a silica based or alumina based uh, liquid and, and fire it. Of course, it's hard to clean the uh, mold when you're done when you're done with that you really have to use a green scrubby and get all the residual um, um, uh, material off but it, it works really well if you want to make 10 of the same thing to rigidize or stiffen this okay so now um, what I'm going to do is put the veins in and you can get fiber paper it's 1 16th inch 1 32nd and quarter inch and this is eighth so you can actually you know peel some of this off and make it thinner or you can cut it so it's thinner and make it look tapered so I'll do a, 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 a I'll do a side vein. The main vein you want to be a little thicker if you want to make it look realistic. So I'll, I'll lay all these in and then kiln wash it again, just paint it again. Here's another one. And the taper, the taper is nice. And the same with these other ones. Um, uh, with the ginkgo, for example, um, you want to taper the stem to make it look more naturalist, natural. Um, I love these, these ginkgos. Let's see. I think that's all we need to do here. So we can talk about our glass. Okay, so this will dry. Um, I pre-fire the kiln wash and this fiber paper to get rid of the moisture. And then I'll put a disc on top and, and fire it. Okay, so let's go to, um, let's see, I don't need that. We don't need this. Okay. So now, what about the glass? Um, how do you get a disc? Uh, what, are the, what are the advantages and constraints to using window glass, float glass? Well, as I said, float glass is not meant to be refired. So what we do is uh, we test it for compatibility with other glasses if we want to mix it. And compatibility has, uh, in, in general, means uh, if one, it, when you um, mix one glass with another kind of glass and you don't know what it is and you melt them together, they're not likely to be happy. They're, one is going to expand more or less than the other. And one rule of thumb we go by is the coefficient of a linear of thermal expansion. Let me put that on the board just so you'll know. So generally, we talk about, 
like bullseye's glass being 90 COE, which is actually 90 times 10 to the minus seventh, but this is how much, it's a coefficient of how much the glass expands in um, millimeters at about, uh, over a range of temperatures. So 90 COE expands, say, say it expands that much, okay? 96, which is uh, a glass that's used in furnaces, yeah, that expands more. So that'll expand this much if you have a piece of glass, you know, and you actually measure this stuff. Okay, so what is float? It depends on the manufacturer. They, do, they don't care if it's compatible. The, the best compatible glass is the 90 COE bullseye glass because they formulated it to be compatible and all expand and contract at the same rate. Float has a whole range. Uh, it could be 75 to 80. Generally, it is 81 to 83, but you can't depend on that because it depends on who's making the glass. It depends on which bin you get the glass from if that bin contains glass that was all made at the same time. So we'll need to know this. Um, what do you think pyrex, what do you think boro is? Borosilicate, which is like pyrex? Anybody know? <laughs> it's 32. So it doesn't, it doesn't move hardly at all. And that's why you could put it in the oven. I mean, it's not gonna expand and contract and set up stress. So you can't mix this glass with this glass. And so we need to test for compatibility, and I'm going to show you how to do that. So um, what our students did first is to take um, several kinds of glass and put them uh, on a base of glass that they want to use for, for projects. So um, there's tempered glass here that's been broken up. There's some spectrum. There's a control of a self piece here. And other glasses that are around that we want to know if we can mix together. So um, let's see how we look at that. We look for stress. This is a light box. And these are called polarizing filters. So they, they, look, they look fine here. One of them you can see is so incompatible that it's even cracked. Can you see that? It's really amazing. So if you turn this sideways and uh, look through the filters, uh, do we turn the lights off or not? Can you see that? Look at, look at the flare around that one. Totally incompatible. That's incompatible. Um, this looks good. Let's see. This looks good. This might be a self, a control. But you know, if you see that stress flare, you don't want to mix that t those two glasses together. So that is how you can test for com compatibility. So what else about float do we need to know? It's a really hard glass. Um, it's stiffer. Its viscosity is, 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 is high. It's very viscous. Um, how is float? Why is it called float glass anyway? That's, this, is a, this is a fun thing. Float glass is made by, since 1959 anyway, uh, by floating molten glass over a bed of tin. So the, the tin is liquid and the glass is liquid, but the, and it, it took Pilkington 10 years to figure this out and a million dollars in, in over in, in Europe. And then he sold that uh, franchise to the US and that's 90% of all the glass that's made now is, is float glass. Well, what happens is that molten tin leaves a little film of tin oxide on the bottom part 
of the glass that was in touch with the uh, um, tin. So how do you know which is the tin side and why should you care? Well, the tin side gives you a better release. It's less like from a mold. It's less likely to devitrify. Uh, but the downside is that it, if you use enamels on the tin side, they shift color a little bit because of the, um, the, the oxide. Well, how can you tell if you've got the tin side or the air side? Well, we use a tin scope, and it's a UV, um, use a UV short wave, short wave, not long wave. Long wave is black light, that's 365. Uh, nanometer short wave is, is 254. So I'm going to turn this on. You can buy smaller tin scopes for, they run about $80. Some people say you could taste the tin side because it has a metallic taste. I haven't gotten that to work. So, uh, so now the light's on and I don't know. Let's see. There we go. All right, do you see that haze? You guys see this haze? That's the tin that's showing. So we know that's the tin side. Well, let's check the other side. Do you see any haze on that side? No, so we know this is the tin side. We always fire it with the tin side down because it, it gives a smoother surface than the air side. So now that this is tin side down, I often take a marker and just, you know, mark it a little bit so I know where I am. And I know I'm going to, this is the air side, I know I'm going to slump it that way. Okay, what else do we need to know about this? We're going to go into tempering later. What else do we need to know about um, float glass? I think that's... Oh, it, it, it devitrifies easily, which means at uh, a range of temperatures, uh, the glass gets a little crystalline surface, and it's you know impossible to get off any way other than sandblasting or scraping it off. And then it'll uh, some people really like devitrification, and enhance it to make a you know a, a design statement. But most of the time, we, we really don't want it. And if you have old glass or glass that's devitrified and you want to melt it and you want a nice surface, there's a way to, to treat it, and that is with borax. So before I cut a piece of glass, I'll tell you about that. So you make up a solution of borax and you just spray it on the glass. So what, what kind of solution is this? It's like a tablespoon of 20 mule, <laughs> mule team borax, uh, and you put that in a cup of hot water, and add a drop or two of, of a detergent that will break the surface tension. And if you want it a thicker preparation that you can actually paint on the edges of something or uh, you don't want it so liquidy, you want it more viscous, you can squirt any kind of um, cellulose-based binder, glass tack, water-friendly medium, um, and that will thicken up the borax. And then um, I like to use a, a mister, um, fortunately I'm out of gas here, and make a fine mist of this. You can use a sprayer and you just try to get a a finer mist on top of the glass before, right before you fire it. All right, why don't we um, why don't we cut a circle, and then we'll explode the tempered glass later. So this has already been cut, so we're going to cut another one. You probably could you, you can find videos online on how to cut glass, but. Everybody does it a little bit differently. I like to use a, a carpet surface. Actually, I learned this from Todd at, um, at General Glass in Beltsville, where I dumpster dive for, for a case of beer sometimes. All right, we need the, uh, the big piece. And we're going to 
we're going to cut it ten, ten side. We're going to cut it ten side down. You okay? Yeah, I don't know which side we need to go. Oh, we need to find out. Okay. All right. This is a leftover piece of of glass. No, I'm just, I think I can see. Can you tell? This is ten side. This is ten. Yeah, the, yeah, there you go. So we went ten side down, so we flip it over. Now before I cut a circle, this is kind of long, so I think I'm gonna cut some cut the end off. It's nice to have a square too when you're cutting circles. So I'll make this a square. This is about, this is 24 by 24. So I want to cut it. I want to take this part off. So I'm going to do two things here. First, I'm going to mark where I'm going to score it. And for some reason, and maybe it's because it's a really hard glass. Um, uh, since float was made, um, it always works better to, to oil your score and oil your cutter. And classically, kerosene is used. It's cheap and easy to get. So I'm going to do that. Thank you, Becky. Um, there's there's a sort of special kind of um, of cutter you can use with float glass. Um, there's a little wheel here that has an angle that you that cuts your glass. Well, it works a lot better with float glass to have a wider angle. So whether whereas regular cutters have an angle of about 34 degrees, this is this is a little wider and supposedly it opens up the score better. I haven't looked at it under a microscope to see that, but. Okay, you want to apply. Okay, so I applied the oil. Oh, there we are. Yep. And I line this up. These are great. Um, it's nice to cut against something because if you cut your score with it at an angle, it, it'll, it'll run in the wrong direction. Sometimes it runs in the wrong direction no matter what. Um, and if you're cutting glass, there's something called the rule of halves. Uh, if you cut it in half, it's most likely to break evenly. If you try to cut this little piece off here and score it, the glass is going to think as it runs, oh, there's no stress over here. I can go that way. And then you, you, know, you lose that cut. OK. Yeah. So all week we've been using regular cutters. I just brought this from home and I've used it for, I don't know, 20 years and I haven't changed the wheel yet. Hope it, all right, Becky, could you hold that down? You want to cut straight and about five or, hear this score? And you always want to go off the edge. Don't stop, keep going. Make it even, hold it straight up and down. Okay. Now I could use my handy dandy fancy breaker uh, and run that score. But what is even more fun is to pop it off the edge. So I'm going to slip this under the carpet. You want to move the, move the carpet a little bit and pop it. So if you have a hard edge, and you'll see the professionals do this all the time, they just pop it off the edge, or they take a, a quarter inch dowel, put that under the score, bang, and they'll hit it, 
And you want to hold this down just in case. The, car there's, the carpet does not need to be here. And then you break it. And good cut. Why is that? They're telling me to stand. You know, they <laughs> <laughs> I watch us keep track of things. Okay, so now we're going to cut a circle out of this um, piece. Where'd it go? It's under here. Oh. All right, let's put it back on top of the carpet. The carpet's good because it has a little give, and you can see what you're doing. And this is not quite square. When you're cutting circles, you want to leave at least 10% of an edge because otherwise it could go off in the wrong direction. It's also good to um, think about, you know, just leaving at least 10%. So this is my handy dandy cutter that I really love. Uh, silver snit, you can get it most anywhere and it'll last for years. So I want to find the center here, and I can just approximate that because I want to put my cutter in the center of this piece of glass. So I think I can see that. Yep. Okay. So that's roughly the center. Now there's a little suction cup here. And the size of the piece of glass that we want, if we're going to use this mold, this is pretty big. Um, so uh, we'd want to make one about the size. We want, the, we want to make one about 16 inches diameter. Let's see where that falls. So you set this to eight, Your, um, all the markings have worn off, so they're kind of hard to see. Oh, here we go. Okay, so you tighten down the, the tool to keep this from sliding. This is what you're going to use to run the score. And you put this in the middle. Let's see, yeah, that's fine. And makes a suction, okay? Then you want to see, okay, so this is tight. You want to check where it's going to go. Because if you had a cup of coffee here, often you just, boom, what happens? It, it, so, um, so how do we cut this then? It's really cool. Uh, get a little piece of a little towel or something and where you score you want to have oil so I just put it on here and I go around and now I know I've oiled where I'm going to cut and I've oiled the cutter and one thing to think about too is you don't want to you don't want to score over your old score. So as soon as you hear it crunching, you know you've gone all the way around. And you want to do even pressure again. So I like to start, you know, knowing where I am in one spot, maybe. And you do the same kind of score. You hear that? Hear that? So, done. Now here's a trick I learned from Burt Weiss, who has been doing, he's been working with float glass probably 60 years on how to tap out a score. Now, in, you know, in the olden days, you had tappers on the end of your, your little Fletcher and you could tap underneath, but um, can everybody see where the score is? Okay, so. Now I'm going to tap it out. So what he did is, and he told me to do it, but I had, is, is quench this. But 
to make it softer, but you know, when you quench hard, and I always thought that made it harder, I wasn't sure. Anyway, you've got a, a little bit of a rocker here by cutting off the edges. So you just tap the score. You put this right over the top, give it a little tap. Now I can see it's run from here to here. You see that? And so then you go about an inch beyond where that is, or two, tap it again. See that? So it's going around. You could, this is great for thick glass. Let's see, I can't see it. Let's see. No, I'm trying to find how, where, how far it's run. Let me see. Okay, I think it's there. Okay, so I'll tap that. I'm going to go over here. You guys see that? Yeah. I said, it may have already gone all the way. No, no, nope. Right. Where, where are we stuck? Here? Uh, now, it's all now it's all the way? Mm -hmm. Okay, if you want to make sure it's all the way, especially with thick glass, you've got to be careful because sometimes the disc just falls out. Um, we're going to torch it. So again, make sure you know you've got a landing spot for this. You got it. Okay. Okay, on a thick glass, sometimes it doesn't go all the way through, and so this just, you hear that? A little thermal? Okay. So, now we need to cut some relief cuts. Is this, the, which is the side we flipped it over? Flipped it over. So now uh, we need to make relief cuts on the same side we cut the disc on. So I'm gonna go like that. And there's different theories on making relief cuts as, as there is with so many things. I, I like to do it here, cut the relief cuts here because that gives you a bigger piece to work with here. Some people say that, oh no, you need to do it on the corner uh, so that, um, so it's less likely to run. So what, but um, like I said, I'm gonna do it here because that's the way I've always done it. And the idea is you want to have the score stop before you get to the ring. Now the, the glass is gonna bend, the glass is gonna run here, but then it's not gonna know where to go and hopefully it'll stop or it'll do, go just to, the, to there. So So we'll go around. Okay, um, with window glass, with uh, bullseye and 96 that are thinner, often you can just start doing that and, and it breaks free. But gla float glass is a lot stiffer, so I like to run the score a little bit around. And you use your pliers with a, a fulcrum and uh, line it up in the direction of your score. Okay, and just hit it lightly. So I hit it lightly, because if you do it hard, it might just keep going. Now, look at that. I can almost get this out without even running another score, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Another advantage of a carpet. It catches all the little pieces, so I'm gonna run it over here. So I need to pull it off the edge, find out where I did the score. 
Oh, there it is. Thank you. Okay, so we've got two pieces. Now, we already ran a score here and here, so you ought to just finish running those because, you know, you don't want gla scored glass stored where you think you've got a whole piece and you really don't because it's been scored. Okay, can you take these, Becky? So now we've got a nice disc, but float glass has another property. It's sharp. It's sharper. It can cut you more easily than... Uh, bullseye. So I use a little sh sharpening stone. It's silicon carbide. So you could do this with any piece of your glass. Just knock the edge off, just just for safety. And like honing and uh, we got a little chipping here, and I'm not sure why, but that will melt. Maybe it's because, yeah, it's probably because of the torching. So, I really torched it. Okay, so now it's a lot safer to handle. So how do we turn this into a disc where we could put, put on here? Because we're only doing one firing, and we're not gonna do any more coal working. So uh, you could do this several ways to clean up the edge. Um, you can go to a wet belt sander if you have one. You can go to a flat lap wheel if you have one. And the idea is to make a smooth edge. And also, I, this, I like to make a little bevel on the side that goes onto the glass because it won't scr scratch the mold and it'll seat a little more gently as it, as it melts in. So it mel melts down. Um, so, when you do this in your studio, get some hand pads and you could, you could create that nice little bevel. And when you fire it, that will melt. Okay. Okay, so... That's our disc, and we'll use this in class. You want to take that? Okay. If there are any questions, I welcome them from the audience on... Oh, I should, one more thing I should tell you. Sorry. You're going to take this into the kiln. You've got a piece of glass on top of it. When you're in the kiln, you want even heat. So what we do is we take kiln furniture, which is, you know, little pieces of little pieces of uh, ceramic material, and elevate the mold off of the kiln shelf just a little bit, not these, uh, and that allows air under it. The other thing is you want everything level, so to do that, you get uh, a, a bubble level is nice, so you want to level your mold first. This is sort of flexible. So you're in your kiln, you want to level the mold first, and then you're going to level your glass. So you say, okay, well, that's pretty good, because you want it to melt down, sink down, slump down at the same rate. Okay, now you've got your glass. Now this actually is a little big. You can get away with a quarter inch over, but this turned out, I made it bigger than I thought it was making, um, so we can use a different mold for this. You want, you could go a quarter inch over the edge uh, because it'll, when the glass slumps in, it'll pull this edge in and go down. So then you level this, it's all fine. You're doing tin side down, air side up, and right before you fire this, you might want to just sprinkle, sift a tiny amount of talc or alumina trihydrate to just smooth everything out a bit. You can also touch up the edges uh, with a little more kiln wash, but generally this is all you'd have to do to finish that. 
<laughs> okay. So we're done with that. So I want to tell you what's going to happen when you take this out of the kiln. So we fired this. And it started out as a disc. So what happened here? Well, wherever we had fiber paper, the glass couldn't sink down. It was impeded by the fiber paper. But where there wasn't fiber paper, the tin side especially does this, started to sink in and we get this nice deckle edge. The other thing that I didn't know was gonna happen, but it turned out to be lovely, is this tin bloom from the tin side stretching. It doesn't do it if you reverse it, but you get this beautiful um, satin effect. I guess you can see that. And this is all in a single firing, so it's pretty cool. I made a bunch of these for my daughter's wedding as centerpieces with Ikebana in the middle and uh, for each table, and uh, they were taking them before dessert was over. Okay, so I think we're gonna move on to tempered glass. So what is tempered glass? Tempered glass is float glass, same, gl same stuff, but it's been treated either chemically or by heat to have tension. And what happens is the, for typical uh, temp tempered glass, what happens is that the after making the glass, it's put back in, the, in, a, in a layer or a, um, an oven, and the top and the bottom are both heated and then cooled. But when they cool, they contract the top and the bottom, but the center is still warm. So the center of that piece of glass wants to cool and contract, but it can't because the top and the bottom are now stiff because they're cooled. That creates the tension. There's another way of doing that, and it's called ion exchange. And uh, that involves sodium ions, which are on the surface of the glass. You put it in a bath with potassium ions, which are bigger molecules, bigger ions, and that puts the glass under tension as well. And that's very similar to our iPhones, Gorilla Glass. That's how that's done. There are a few other little proprietary things they're not telling us about, but it's pretty cool. Okay, so um, you can sandblast your pieces, which kind of have a nice effect. Here was the model, and then this, the back was sandblasted. This is unsandblasted, still makes a nice little gift. Okay, so tempered glass has been treated to break up when it's busted the reason being it's, it's safe that way. It's not the same as um, the uh, safety glass that you have for cars uh, in your, their windshields. That has, that's laminated with a, a plastic material. You don't want to put that in your kiln. Okay. So let's get a piece of tempered. Ooh, we got to move. And uh, the, the uh, tarp, I'm gonna put the tarp. Oh, good, okay. So this might explode a little bit more than we want. We don't know for sure if this is tempered. It's supposed to be tempered. How can you tell? Well, usually there's a little stamp, a little uh, indicator that's been sandblasted on the corner of glass. So that's one way you can tell. Another way you can tell that it's not tempered is if it's got a crack. If it has a crack, it would have blown the whole thing and then it wouldn't be tempered anymore. So why don't you put, just put that down and we'll wrap this. By, by law, uh, exterior windows, exterior doors that are not stained glass doors have to be tempered for safety. Because you can imagine if this broke and you, you know, were at your front door and it fell, uh, would not be pleasant. Okay, so I've got some clamps. This is an old, um, an old uh, a shelf from Corning here, actually. 
And this is the air side, tin side down. And if you want to use this in all these projects that we're making, uh, you want to know what the air side is so that you can orient your shards upwards to the air side, tin side down. If it, if it doesn't, if you can't keep track of every little piece, so that doesn't really matter. So what we're making is out of tempered glass after we explode it is um, putting the pieces back in a mold and firing it in single firing. Um, the flow glass gets its color from um, the iron content. You can get something called Starfire that doesn't have iron. It uh, devits more easily. Uh, it's beautiful. Some people that do shower doors don't want the greenish color. So I'll show you a little bit more what you can make. You can sandblast the back, which is very pretty. You can make designs. You can make uh, coasters. You can slump shapes. So let's, ex let's see if this explodes. Oh, another way you can tell, and you th this has happened. I thought, oh, this is uh, not tempered. I'm going to break it up and use it. So I score it. I try to break it. I try to break it. It won't break. Uh, you can take a big piece, and we did this in class, and hit it with a hammer in the middle and won't break. It needs to have the tension released at a corner to really break. Those big pieces that you saw in the um, dumpster diving, when they put those big pieces and dropped them, they didn't break. They had to. Okay, so let's cut this into little shards. And I'm going to expose the corner, just one corner. And we'll, we'll hold this out here. So everybody needs to have safety glasses. If I had a hammer, who wants to hammer? Anybody want a hammer? You want a hammer? <laughs> okay, ready? Okay, I'm just going to hit the corner. You know what? This may not be tempered. Okay, hold on. Let me do it. A little. No, it's not tempered. All right, we got to get a tempered piece. Uh, yes, it is tempered. Okay, so let's look at what we got. Uh, what's, what is really cool about hitting it on a corner is that the glass will radiate in a directional way and you'll get lines. And the edges are turn out to be beautiful. Uh, you could they're like feathers, and you can book match them. Now, a lot of, if you listen, you'll hear it'll continue to crinkle. And so these larger pieces, they're really quite pretty, can be used as design elements. You can break them up if you want, you know, smaller elements, but um, it's really nice to have the, um, the, look at that edge, isn't that pretty? It's really nice to have the ability to break these up into the shapes and sizes you want. So um, those are two things you can do, temper glass and cut designs. I wanted to just briefly mention all the other things you can do. Uh, you can paint. You can paint on glass, on float glass. You can lay it on sand and get a relief. You can, um, this is just a design with, with pebbles, and we're, we're doing this today. In addition, you can paint. There's three companies that now, that are left that make uh, flow-compatible enamels and frit. Uh, the three companies that used to, CNR Lou and Armstrong and Yakagani, that used to make float compatible uh, frit and glass no longer make them, but at least there's now three left, plus um, that are, uh, plus Ruche, which is another really good one. So we got Thompson's Enamels, we have Pharaoh's Sunshine, and we have Easy Fuse. So this is Thompson Enamels, just sprinkled on a disc, fired, 
flipped it over, sprinkled on a disc again, blow glass, and then put in a mold. You could paint on glass. It's, uh, this is, you know, this is classic. People have painted on glass for years. Uh, so if you're a painter, that works. Beautiful colors are available. This is the Sunshine palette. You can paint organics and fire them. These are uh, leaves painted with sunshine enamels and, and fired with mica underneath so it'll release. So it's... And then one other one. Oh, this is fun. Make plaster feet out of your grandkids' uh, feet when, they not, when they're not wiggling their toes. This is just two pieces of window glass laid on top of two feet there that were uh, cast in plaster. So that's casting. There's a, a book that was produced some time ago by Cindy Coldiron, and this should give you ideas on all the kinds of things you can make with glass. Um, I've got a couple pictures of my work in here, and there you can see the aspen leaf that we just demonstrated. And my current work is um, using window glass and, and raw chemicals to make underwater scenes. As a biologist, and I have a deep interest in undersea microscopic and macroscopic creatures and hydrothermal vents. And I'll show you another slide about that. I'm entertaining questions if they have any from the gallery. Let me go to the next one. This is a hydrothermal vent. 3.5 billion years ago, the, when the sun came out, organisms that were almost like bacteria uh, were using sulfur and ammonia and other chemicals for energy. Then sunlight came and we now have cellular structures. And when I, I first used float glass to try to show what underwater scenes look like with vents, I don't have any pictures of the vents I'm making now, but they almost look like it. So I'm working on that, and we're back to little creatures. What temperature are you firing to? Um, it depends on how thick the glass is. Uh, we, I go up to 1550 at maximum. Really like to stay under 1500. Uh, 1490, 1440. Most of everything we're doing in this whole week is 1440. Unless we're setting the paint, then it's a lower temperature. Flow glass doesn't like to be heated up high, and the mantra is low and slow. Go up slow, make sure the glass is happy, and go down slow so you're not introducing stress, um, and uh, you'll be really successful at it. Questions? Okay, go make some glass.